もうかりまっかぼちぼちでな。Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of the Tim Ferriss Show. And holy guacamole, do I have a treat for you. I had so much fun with this interview. The guest is none other than Neil Strauss, a close friend of mine, seven time, I think, New York Times bestselling author. He has written Many books, including The Game, for which he's best known, perhaps. Emergency, for which I was a proofreader. And there's a hilarious story behind that that we get into. And many, many others. He is, uh, he has written what many consider sort of the definitive rock memoir or biography, which was The Dirt about Motley Crue. He has written with people including Marilyn Manson, Jenna Jameson, on and on and on, rules of the game. The guy is prolific. And he is also and has been contributing editor at Rolling Stone, staff writer for the New York Times. Why am I listing off all of these credentials? Because the conversation that I have with Neil is about the creative process. How do you become a creative powerhouse? What are the methods that he uses? What are the tricks that he has up his sleeves when times get tough, when he's on deadline, when he wants to create the next best selling book, when he wants to write a book that can become a movie, when he wants to create a business? And he's built some very, very profitable businesses, which is something not many people know. So, this entire conversation, I hope you enjoy. If you want a part two, if you'd like to hear a part two, please let Neil and I know on Twitter. And two other things. Number one, This episode is brought to you by you guys. I'm not going to browbeat you with advertisers. I want to avoid that, but this thing has to be self sustaining. The podcast takes time and does take money to put together. So please visit the Tim Ferriss Book Club. Go to fourhourworkweek.com forward slash books. I'll give you a second to write that down. It's fourhourworkweek.com forward slash books. This is a book club, kind of like Oprah's book club. Every month or two, I Put out a book that I think, or I should say, I promote a book that has changed my life that really never made it into the limelight. A book that never got the attention it deserved. And this ranges from books on investing to learning to travel to philosophy. They're super fun. So check them out fourhourworkweek.com forward slash books. And、uh, please take a look. That would help the show. Last, For show notes, all of the links, URLs, book recommendations, and so on from this interview, all you have to do is go to fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, no numbers, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash podcast for all the goodies. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Neil. I hope you enjoyed the show and thank you for listening. Optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start to shake. Can I ask you a personal question? Now it is the appropriate time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. Neil, my good man, welcome to the Tim Ferriss Show. Thanks for making the time. Cool. Thanks for having me. And congrats <laughs> on the podcast, by the way. Great. Thanks. I am、uh, selfishly. Bringing you into the fold in part because I want to pick your brain on creative process and interviewing, but we'll get to that. For people who may not be familiar with your work,、uh, how many New York Times bestsellers do you have now? Six, seven, twelve, twenty? Yes,、uh, seven. That's incredible. Lucky number seven. Three have just about killed me. I'm not sure I have more books in me, but、uh, you didn't start off writing books,、right. as I understand it. Where did you, what was the path that you took? To get to writing your first book? You know, what's funny is I recently had my family send everything I'd ever written, just all my old, like, kind of, you know,、uh, grade school stuff here. And I thought I just had written my first book later in life than I actually did. But it turned out when I was in second grade, I wrote a book and I tried to get it. Maybe it, was, it might have been a little later than second, maybe fourth grade, however old you are when you're 11. I actually wrote a book, <laughs> tried to get it published, sent it out to publishers with a note saying, hey, send, or, and to agents, and wrote an entire book, which not only did it get rejected, but I never got a single response back from a single agent or publisher. So it really <laughs> inured me to, to rejection, which is cruel.、Cool. Like, who would not send a letter back to some poor kid? That's <laughs> really, it makes, me, it makes me have even less sympathy. For the traditional publishing world than I already do, perhaps. But you, you really sort of honed your teeth or cut your teeth, I guess the expression is, as a journalist, right? New York Times and other places? Yeah, yeah. I wrote for the New York Times for like 10 years and Rolling Stone for like ever. 
And uh, speaking of rejection, you have, I remember, a letter, I believe, from Phil Collins framed on your wall. Yeah, yeah, I, have, yeah, I, I, was, I had a review to Phil Collins' concert, and it wasn't that good. It was, it's at the New York Times, it was, and I was really trying to be gentle in the, in the review, but I guess he got upset by it, and I get in the mail this two-page handwritten screed, and the last words are, well, Neil, fuck you, Phil Collins. And <laughs> it was, wasn't I, it on, like, hotel stationery, if I remember correctly, or something like yeah, that? It was from the Peninsula Hotel, so I called his publicist just to make sure that it wasn't, like, a <laughs> fake and know he was there staying at the Peninsula Hotel. And I think later on TV he said that he had, like, someone told me a Saturday interview where he regretted writing, writing, writing this letter. And it's funny because, you know, I did a book of my interviews called Everyone Loves You When You're Dead. And it just really goes to show you that Everybody, everybody out there who's succeeding on a high level in this culture has this persecution thing going on. No one I've interviewed doesn't feel, if you really get down to it, feel like they're not respected by their peers, they're not respected by the press, nobody understands them, no one understands what they're doing. And, and we're talking not, you know, even beyond Phil Collins' level, like Chuck Berry level, who invented rock and roll, like, and it seems that, that you know, as long as you're living and it depends on what you pay attention to, you will, you will always get criticized as you're doing great things. And the greater they get, the greater the criticism becomes. How have you, or rather, how is your approach? Because I'd love to dig into sort of the nuts and bolts of how you approach the creative process. How has your writing changed, if at all, from when you were on deadline writing pieces for the New York Times? And, and let's just assume they're the pieces on the shorter side and book writing. Because one thing that's always struck me, and it's given me a lot of insecurity, is that I do feel like I get writer's block and it can last for extended periods of time. But when I talk to my friends who are trained journalists, they have just seemingly eradicated the belief, the concept of writer's block from their minds. They're like, look, I don't have a choice. I have to have this in by five o'clock. I don't have the luxury of thinking about writer's block. I mean, how has your process changed? And what are your recommendations to people who are trying to really write something substantive for the first time? So I will say something which is this, which is writer's block does not actually exist. And, and I'll tell you how I know. I was speaking to a group and I thought, hey, I'm going to do an exercise. And I had them write something really challenging. I said, your first sentence, I can give you guys the, uh, the first sentence. I want you to write the most interesting first sentence you can possibly write. So interesting, someone has to read the second sentence. And then, and I, would, and then I took them through maybe five sentences, each one challenging. This sentence, I want you to write something that makes somebody feel something emotionally. Now I want you to tie this sentence back. And I made, it, I, I made it really challenging, and I gave them just a few minutes for each sentence. Everybody completed the exercise. Everybody in the room, people, even people who aren't writers, people who are professional writers, people who are screenwriters, people who you know, think that they're not writers. And it proved to me that there's no such thing as writer's block. Writer's block is almost like the equivalent of impotence. It's the performance pressure you put on yourself that keeps you from doing something you naturally hmm. should be able to do. Interesting. Okay. So writer's block, the reason... You don't get writer's block as a writer because, because you have a deadline and it has to be in and you have no choice. But if you sit there and you think this piece has to be the ultimate article or the ultimate book ever been written and, and my entire self-esteem is wrapped up in this and, and this is me and, I'm, you know, and the more the bigger of a story you make up about what you are doing, the bigger the block will get because, because uh, it's, it's all – it has nothing to do with the talent of writing, the skill of writing. It's all completely a uh, performance anxiety. So I read, I read a quote recently, which I thought was very applicable to me anyway, because I have a tendency to put like the weight of the world on my shoulders when I'm trying to write things, which doesn't help. And right. the, the quote was, the essence of creativity is fucking around. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think there's, I think there's some truth to that. But when you're writing to avoid some of that pressure, I know we've talked about this before, but for people who haven't heard this because it was a long time ago, you do a number of different drafts or revisions and there are four different right. people. Could you just expand on that? Yeah. Like I would say that if I can give like one tip that will help anyone get their things done is when you start writing, just write to the end, just write to the end. The only time when I start writing something, I try to get a nice first couple pages or a nice couple first paragraphs. Cause it's just a nice little balance, a nice little sort of weight to drop the rest of my book or project on. So you can spend some time on that, but when you're done, just write to the end. Just get it all done. Get the story out there because the truth is it's not really until you get the end of what you're writing that you really sometimes even know what it is or where it's going or what it's going to become. So you just write to get to the end. And your first draft is only – this is for you. No one's ever going to see it, so you don't have to worry about it. You're not going to turn it in. You're not going to show it to friends to evaluate. This is only for you. And the fun part about that first draft is when you're done, somewhere in that mess of words, you just wrote the entire book. 
the entire book is in there and you don't have to deal with anything else. You're done with your notes because you put them all in there. All your thoughts are in there. Somewhere in that mess is your book. And now you just have to carve it and shape it into the actual book. So my first draft is always for me. And, 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 but the, and that's the easy part, by the way. The easy part is the first draft. The tough part is the second draft because the second draft is for the reader. Is this, is this what you wanted me to talk about? Yeah, this is exactly what I wanted yeah. you to mention. So yeah, the second draft, so the second draft is for the reader. So here's the thing. Your life may be really fascinating to you. But most of it is really boring to somebody else, <laughs> you know, or your ideas may be really fascinating to you and maybe you've come by them, worked really hard to get to those ideas or you've, you've suffered and agonized and this thing you, is going to change everything. But some of it is just boring to other people. <laughs> it's interesting to you, but it's boring to other people. And you have to have a filter on that says, this is what's interesting and this is what's boring. This is what's repetitive. This is what's new. So the second draft is where the real pain comes in. I mean, literally the book I'm writing, I just cut out a 125 page chunk that took me months of research and months of writing and I had, and I had to go and it's a better book for it. Now the 125 <laughs> that you cut, what is the total page count now? <laughs> the total page count right now is, is 675 pages. Holy um, shit. I, okay. So you, is, but you, but you, by the way, it's on, it's, that's less than a book, but that's how much it is on a, on, on a computer screen. Got it. All right. So you cut out, you know, a good, say, fourth or third of the book at this point, which was my experience with The 4-Hour Chef. I mean, I cut 250 pages from The 4-Hour right. Chef, and it was still a monster. The, right. And, and, that, and that was just a, a, a discrete chunk. There are other parts I've cut, too, so I've probably cut out five or 600 pages. And in this case, it's usually not that brutal. Yeah. But you know what? I, and I had to write, write it there. To, here's the crazy thing. And just tell me if I'm getting too esoteric, because yeah. I love talking about the creative process and writing. But... This is the crazy thing, okay? And I hope that I can say this in a way that people understand will change what they're doing. The book is smarter than you. Mm. In other words, I'll, write, I'll sit down to write a book with an intention to write a book about a certain topic. And I'll sit down and I'll start writing it and then I'll read it and I'll be like, you know what? When I write the truth down on paper and I look at that, I get a kind of clean perspective. And so a book I'll sit down with the intention to write, that book, I have to let that book become something else sometimes. And that's the right book. Definitely. No, that's, I've been looking at screenwriting a lot recently and I heard a quote, which is not always true, of course, but it, I found it very insightful as sort of a fortune cookie concept, which was you, you don't know the first sentence of your book until you've written the last sentence. And so true. let me d drill into one of the things you said, which is the second draft who's for your reader. Are you actually taking the first draft and allowing other people to read it? Or are you putting on your hat of the reader and pretending to be the reader with their eyes as you read what you've done. Yeah, no, no one will ever see the first draft. And I hope if someone saw it, I mean, I think it would, I would think it would be unpublishable and, and embarrassing. And, and yeah, I would never, this first draft, nobody sees. Okay. And the second, the second draft is, I mean, here's the other thing. I think the art of succeeding in anything in life is the art of empathy. Mm -hmm. And this is your empathizing with whatever your general idea of a reader is. And my reader is never somebody who is a, already a reader. My idea is just, Hey, who is, well, you know, what is somebody, my reader is me as a reader, probably, <laughs> you know, it's right. me reading a book and thinking, Oh my God, will this guy just get on with it? Or reading a book and thinking, you know what, this guy is like not even living up to what he's writing and saying he's doing is a total hypocrite or whatever I'm thinking when I'm, when I'm reading. So my reader is just kind of almost me the way I would read a book critically. Got it. And what's the next revision? Yeah. So, so yeah, so that draft, and again, that's, that's a tough draft. That's when those, all those phrases, kill your babies and let go of these. That's, I think the art of the writing is they really end the revisions for me. Definitely. And, and then I've done, and I've got a book, and I feel like it's a great story. The third draft is for the haters. Mm -hmm. So the idea is with the third draft is, okay, I've written the story. The story's really interesting, but there are going to be people who have an opposite viewpoint. There are going to be you know, press and critics reading it. There's going to be this, and I'm never, I'm never going to cater to them. I'm not going to change my point of view. I'm not going to change my ideas. I'm not going to change what I stand for. I'm not going to censor myself ever. Mm -hmm. but what I will do is make it do my best to make it immune to criticism mm -hmm. in the sense of a, I'm going to make sure that my facts are, are iron tight. I'll always mm -hmm. hire maybe one or two or three fact checkers because if somebody can just find one weakness, you know, that's yeah. it. They can just, they can throw out the baby with the bathwater. He was wrong about that. He knows nothing. Or, yep. So, but the, but the second more important thing is, and I always use Eminem as an example, you can't really criticize Eminem because he's already in his songs. He already sort of impersonates the critics and then answers them. Mm -hmm. So I really want, there's nothing that anyone said, many people have said about it in my books that aren't already really actually answered in a book or accomplished in some hopefully self-aware way. So I really want to sort of 
answer their critics, their questions, their, their critiques, and they're in a way that's still kind of fun and entertaining. So that's sort of the idea of maybe hater-proofing it. So I, I, and, and it's okay, by the way, you always get haters, but you want your haters to be wrong. <laughs> right. You have to have a fortified defense against criticism, right. warranted and unwarranted, right? Unre- right. Reasonable and unreasonable criticism. When, when, it, could you give an example from one of your books? Uh, sure. I know how fucking secretive you are, so you're not going to tell me about, you're not, probably not going to dig into the details of the new book, but let's do maybe a historical yeah. example. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Writing the Game, which is the book where I spent two years in this secret subculture of pickup artists. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, I'm writing it, I'm writing the book for for the book that I would have needed, you know, in college and high school and the book that I, that maybe would have made me feel a little less lonely growing up and also, you know, trying to make it fun and entertaining and mythological and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mythological in the sense that all my books, I try to have an underpinning that's a, that's a, and we can get back to that later. I try to have an underpinning in the books. It's a great story arc. But then I read it. I want to, I want to read it from the point of view of, of somebody who, Maybe it's not my audience of, of, of a woman who's found it in her, you know, husband's drawer or, or, or boyfriend's closet or maybe just a, someone on writing for Jezebel or one of those blogs right. and to think, okay, if they actually read the book, can I write it in such a way that they really don't find fault with the book itself? There can be fault with the characters, but not the book itself. Right. And so I went through and any time a woman was referred to in a way that I thought was objectifying you know, I would just kind of make it, make sure that there was nothing that felt, you know, that woman, if somebody was not rated by state of numbers <laughs> or every time you describe them, you're not describing a certain body part. Mm-hmm. And it's actually just smart Yep. because nobody wants to read that. Right. Definitely. Is so, that the, so, so that was one way of going through and just saying, mm-hmm. Hey, you know what, let me read this. So, so you're kind of like the first book you write from your perspective. The second, maybe you write from your perspective as a reader, even more so than your ideal reader, I think, because if it's not interesting to you, it's going to be interesting to nobody. <laughs> um, right. And the third, you kind of put on different hats. Okay, what's a, you know, a feminist reading, reading, reading a game? And another example is I read through the game, and I thought, I wish there was a female character in this book, but it's based on my life, and I really wasn't in that community. There wasn't really a strong female character. I had a relationship outside of the woman I ended up dating at the end. So I couldn't do that. So I thought, you know what, it needs a female point of view. So, But before each section, I put a kind of a counterpoint quote from a feminist thinker to just say, hey, there's another point of view and this is what it is. Mm-hmm. So in that last draft, you're putting on different hats of the people who are not your audience and how are they going to read the book? No, that makes, that makes perfect sense. And I, I take a, a similar approach. I often try to address as many of these points as possible in my introductions or prefaces. Right. That is to say, for instance, in the four-hour body or the four-hour chef, I'll say, many of my conclusions are based on the following assumptions and the following process. Like, and then to, at least for that type of book, to say it's very likely, almost certain, that not everything in this book is 100% accurate. So this will evolve as the book evolves and reaches more people. Just, again, to deflect the criticism that it hasn't been, let's say, you know, 100% verified. Because in some cases, there, is, there are theories, there's speculation, whatever it might be. But addressing that early, because realistically, like if people start reading the book, where are they going to start? Typically in the beginning, right? How do you incorporate reader? And, and just, just, just to sort of clarify something, which is when Tim is doing this or I'm doing this, what you're doing is a book is like a little world or it's like a software program. You're debugging it. It's yeah. not we're like, we're like, oh, no, we don't want to get criticism. Of course, we get a lot of it and, and some of it deserves, some of it not deserves. But what we're trying to do is create a, create a program that doesn't have bugs in it because – you know, at least in the old book model, you didn't get to do a version two. Now, now you can do that with Kindle and stuff. But we're trying to create a, you know, trying to create a completely self-contained world that has no bugs. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think just like software, you know, if you want everyone to be your fan, no one's going to be your fan because you'll have to so true dilute oh, it to so the true. point. Like, if no one is going to have a negative response to your book, it's very unlikely that anyone will have a strong positive response. And you, you have to kind of defend against that and make sure that you're focusing on how many people get it and not how many people don't get it. But to that point, how do you currently incorporate feedback from other readers, say writers, people who are proofreading? And the reason I ask, people might find this amusing, is I remember proofreading parts of Emergency. And the lengths that you went to with me, now granted, we've known each other for a long time now. And I just remember going to like this hotel. I don't know why you were working out of a hotel. We can talk about that. And the only reason that you gave me parts of the book were because I said, 
you wouldn't tell me what the book was about. And then I, then I just threw out a Hail Mary and I said, what's the book about? Something related to five flags. And I remember that, yeah. that freaked yeah, you that. out. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, wait, wait, did somebody tell you? And then you would give me something like 40 to 50 printed out pages at a time in a, like a FedEx folder. And then I would have to bring those back before I could have the second like set of 50 pages. So how are you currently doing that? Are you doing it in a very, and, and by the way, I agree maybe you can expand on this, but like that memes get released accidentally and you have to be very careful about that because books take so goddamn long to make, right? You don't want to exactly. like you prematurely release this idea virus so that you can't harness it later. But how do you have people, other people, if you do proofread your stuff and provide feedback? <laughs> it's a funny thing that I'm doing it right now, which is they come over to the house and they read it as much as they can tolerate. And then they come over to the house another day. Uh, <laughs> And, and the second reason for that is the books haven't had a legal, haven't had the, the legal read yet. So a lot of, you know, a lot of my books are stories or true to life stories. And when I'm writing from life, I really use the real names when I'm writing the first draft and the real identifying details and characteristics yep. before the lawyers get their hands on it. So I don't want it to float around because I'm giving away a big thing right now. So hopefully no one in my book listens to this, but of course. So my great cop out of when I'm writing about somebody, I usually say, oh, don't worry. You were a cop as a character that I use pieces of you and pieces of someone else so that <laughs> when they read it, they can say, oh, those good parts must be me and the bad parts are obviously the other person. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, A, I just I kind of write it all down with real people's names and identifying details. And I don't want to, that to get out because I either A, am respecting their privacy or their, or don't want them to see me. Got it the people who come over and read as much as they can tolerate. Cause I remember doing something very similar for one of your books might've been your last book. Right. How are you choosing the people you have proofread your stuff? Like what, maybe you could just give us, you don't have to guys names, yeah, obviously, okay, but yeah, like what types yeah, of people do you process. ask to read your stuff? Yeah. What's your process? Yeah. So the truth is it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be say someone like yourself who's an accomplished author and has been on the bestseller list. I'm just trying to get as many different people to read it as possible uh, who, who are willing to, who are willing to read it. So a lot of people think, you know, I've never hired, let's say, you know, they're hired the hardest thing. I think a harder thing to find than a writer, a good writer is to find a good editor. Yeah. So as, as you know, so I really just have as many people read it as possible. And I have a process and I'll, I'll share this process with you because I think it's good, not just for writing, but for getting any kind of feedback and criticism in life not just about a project you're doing, but about yourself, which mm-hmm. is, this is the way, this is the best metaphor for it. It's a catch. I'm trying to remember who told to me, I think it was a guy named Brent. And this is, he kind of had this basic concept, which is it's a catcher's mitt. So when someone gives you feedback, you catch it in your catcher's mitt. Then you look at it. And one of three things are possible. It's true. If it's true, then, then I put it in my head, right? The secret to life is not to take it personally, obviously. So any criticism is criticism on your technique, not on you. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. people personalize stuff so easily. So you catch it before you're, you take it and you look at it. If it's true, you insert it. If it's not true, you throw it away. And if you're, if it's a maybe, if you're not sure, if it's a maybe, you just keep it in the mid, you show it to a couple other people, you know, hey, Tim, hey, so-and-so, what do you think of this? And then you, then you reevaluate and decide yes or no. But here's the best stuff. The best stuff is you get a piece of feedback, say you read the book, you tell me something. I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't think that's true. Then whatever, my wife reads it. Nah, you know what? I think that she's wrong. And then I get it from one or two other people. And then I, then instead of throwing it away, I'll look at it again. And that's when you get the real truth is. So the more people you can have give you feedback and there's a piece of feedback you reject that keeps coming back to you, it's time to reevaluate that. And then you can get a real, real epiphany that changes you. That's where growth is. How many people do you typically have proofread a given chapter in a book before it goes to say, before you get to kind of pick lock, you know, before you, before you get yeah. to the book being locked and done as a manuscript? Yeah. So yeah. So there's two phases. It's so fun because it really is like people think I've written a book to the end and it's done. You're really only like a quarter done at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but it right. feels good. It feels good. You can have a small celebration. And by the way, when you're done, don't take too much time off of it. You got to get right back to it right away because otherwise you're going to forget. You know, doing a book or a screenplay or a big project, it's a lot of information you're holding in your head. It's a yeah. tight thread. There's a lot of connective and, uh, tissue that you forget that isn't in the book, but that you need as glue to kind of hold it all in your head. Exactly. And if you go away for, say, three weeks to get back, it'll take you a week or two to get that, get those connections going again. And let's talk about a little time management later, because every time you're interrupted when you're doing something creative, it takes you 20 minutes to get back to the state before that phone rang and that person asked you that question. So, but back to the feed. So there's two stages. One is in the early stages, maybe when I'm still in the second variation, the reader variation, I'll have a couple people just read it through so I can just see if it's as kind of test readers so I can make sure it's engaging and not boring 
or maybe there's a part I'm not sure about, man, this feels too long. So I'll have a few people, two or three people come in and read it. But then when I'm, I feel like I'm all done and it's being edited at, at the Parker Collins in my case, and it's being edited, then I'll kind of print it out fully and have some people read it from front to back and really as many people as will tolerate and get as many, as many feedback and comments and criticisms as I, as I can. And there are a few people like yourself and a couple other people who I will always give it to as sort of like kind of people whose opinions I'm going to take a little, you know, a lot more seriously than my, uh, the cable repairman. So read it, I'll give it to him. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? It's more important if it works for him, it may be more important than if it works for, say, you or another author. Well, here. definitely, because it, it's tough for a lot of authors to take off their editor slash book writing hat. They go into the weeds right from the outset as opposed to just reading the book as a reader, if that makes sense. But one approach that I took with the last two books that seemed to work pretty well I do think The 4-Hour Chef tried to do too much. I think it could have been four or five books very easily, and it would have made the positioning of each of them a lot easier. But, right. But, uh, and by the way, that's my thing. I'm so upset that you didn't take my feedback on it. Yeah. <laughs> I have one big piece of feedback. It's too hard. You were too invested in it. Yeah. I mean, not that you were too far along in it, but I always think I really feel, uh, I feel like, yeah. It should have been multiple books, and who knows? Maybe they'll get split up at some point in the future, because they could be. But where I was going to go is I typically give proofreaders – three to five chapters. My chapters tend to be pretty short and they're modular, so that'll usually suffice. And then I'll I'll always ask, you know, what was your favorite chapter? If you had to pick just one to stay in the book, which would it be and why? And then if you had to get rid of one, which would it be and why? And what I found really helpful personally is if anyone loves a chapter, it stays in, end of story. Like if someone over the top loves a chapter, it stays in. If someone dislikes a chapter, I then need a consensus to justify taking it out unless I feel the same way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, I always do that too. It's so good because, yeah, you're looking for criticism. I'll also say, Mark, what you thought, what really moved you, you thought was funny or you wanted to underline, and then I'll be careful about throwing, throwing that out. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. And it's true also with, a, with Everyone Loves You When You're Dead, which was an anthology. It was an anthology of all my favorite moments for my favorite interviews. And with that, I probably, you know, once again, had maybe a thousand interviews I had to cut down and I'd have people come over, I'd have them give them a, do a rating system, and I had a whole tile, and I'd see what rated the highest. And here's the thing that people often don't get, and tell me if this is true for you as well. You know, you often talk about testing a title on, on Facebook or Google AdWords back when that made more sense. Mm-hmm. And you talk about testing it, but tell me if I'm wrong here, but this is how I do it, which is that's just one variable. It doesn't mean, oh, this tested the best, I'm going to do this. It's one input. Okay, there was testing, there was, there's your own intuition, there's your kind of what other experts think, there's what friends think, and you put that all into the, into the mix versus saying, hey, this just tested well, it's the only, and then that must be right, and I'm sticking with that no matter what. Oh, right? def- definitely. And I think right. because the testing was maybe unique at the time that started spreading around as, as a story about the four-hour work week, I think people miss the context, which is I only tested titles that I could live with from the outset. So right. you shouldn't test like a cyborg and end up with a title that you hate and then use that because that will ultimately affect the success of the book. And secondly, most books fail. You could do everything right and the book could fail. Do you want to, can you live with a title you hate even if the book might fail? And the answer is you shouldn't have to. So you, you need to first pick uh, sort of a subset before you test of titles or content or chapters that you can live with. And then you do the testing. The other thing that, um, just on the, on the time management for a second, then I want to ask about interviews is like you said, it's not a question of, do you have the time to do something like run to FedEx and mail something off? The question is, can you afford the interruption? Right. And there's, there's a great article by Paul Graham. He would call it an essay. I think it's just the makers versus the manager's schedule and how for, for a maker, whether it's a programmer or a writer or a musician, if you're in the flow and you get interrupted, it might take you, like you said, 20 to 60 to 90 minutes just to get back to the place where everything that's spread out around you makes sense again. There's a huge cost to interruption. And I mean, you go pretty much completely off the grid right. and have some retreat spots. And I mean, we, we actually, I remember when you were working on your last book and I was working on The 4-Hour Chef, we had some, some retreats, which were really, really helpful. On the interview stuff, because I'm, of course, trying to get better at interviewing. Okay, can I mention a couple things for time management? Because there's a couple things that are just so good. Yes. Yeah, and, definitely. And, and, okay, and I have no investment in whatever in this, but there's one computer program that's probably saved my life. It's been the best investment I've ever made, the 10 bucks or whatever it costs. Okay. I don't know if you have it. Do you have Freedom for the computer? <laughs> Freedom. I use something called Rescue Time and a few others, but Freedom is a fantastic app. Absolutely. 
it's, it's so simple. And I think the great thing about it, it's my favorite program in the world, which is it says, how many minutes of freedom do you want? You put in whatever it is, 120 minutes of freedom. And then you're completely locked off your internet, no matter what, for that amount of time. So as soon as I sit down to write, the first thing I do is I put on freedom because you say you're writing or working, you want to research something, right? You research something and then you get stuck in a clickbait, you know, rabbit, rabbit hole. Right. And, and what you can do is you can save up all the things you want to research and just research them when that, when that time expires and you'll find it so much more efficient. And now I go a little more hardcore, which is because I'm on a real deadline and I mean an even bigger, heavier deadline, which is using, I think right now he's Intego Family Protector, but they're playing a place there that, you know, there's those children's monitoring <laughs> things. And basically my wife put in a password and I can only get online from 5 to 6 p.m. every day and from 11 to midnight. That's the only time I can get online, <laughs> period. And it is great. You will never answer email faster and more efficiently and productively when you know you only got an hour to do it. That's amazing. That's a, what, yeah. what, what was it, Intego Family Protector? Intego, yeah, Family Protector. And again, I don't know the password, so if there's some other, there's emergency that comes up, like we were going to do this on Skype, I would have to have her go type in the password. I don't know it. Yeah. I was wondering why you didn't want to do this on <laughs> Skype. That's hilarious. Okay, now it makes yeah, a lot more sense. So the bigger problem is not other people interrupting you, it's you. You, oh, are, you are the enemy you're fighting. Yeah. <laughs> because, because as soon as something gets challenging, the first thing we want to do, go to is go do something else. And, and if yeah. you stay there, you can work through it or pop through it. But as soon as something gets tough or challenging, the first thing we'll do is find something else we have to do that's not as big or not as important because we just don't want to. We're trying to conserve our energy. That's the way we are as mammals. Well, I remember I, I was looking at a book on nonfiction writing written by Ayn Rand. And I think one of the chapters was called The White Tennis Shoes. And basically the point was – Writers will do anything to avoid writing. And yeah. if she said, if there are white tennis shoes, like within your visual field that have one blemish on them, you will find a way to rationalize cleaning those white tennis shoes instead of doing the writing you're supposed to write. Yeah. So you, so you have to sort of build systems to protect against your lesser self. Right. And you have to find out. So yeah, and it's a great analogy. Like you have to find where your weaknesses are. So whatever your white tennis shoes are, you have to make sure they're nowhere in your eyesight in that space in which, which you write. You have to have the sacred space, the cave you go to, and this is your sacred space. What, at some points, and when I, when I can afford it, I don't even let anyone in that room. I don't want anyone's energy in that room. No one's even allowed in there. Whatever it may be, you have to create your sacred space. There are no clocks in your sacred space because there's no time in your sacred space. No one's allowed in there. If there's something really important, they can slip a note under and you can answer when you want. No one's allowed in the sacred space. So on the subject of productivity and, and, we, and we, no one's going to want to write when we're done yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta be jerk to everybody well you know myself. i mean the first p piece of advice I, I get contacted by a lot of would-be writers who are actually good writers in shorter form oftentimes and they'll ask me uh, most this, this is where i know things are headed for for problems is they'll ask me about right. all the marketing stuff first and yeah. then they'll tell me that they're going to write a book part-time in three to four months <laughs> And, right. and I try to discourage everyone from doing a book unless they can allocate at least a year to it, assuming full time, Monday to Friday. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts because I think a mediocre book is more of a liability than no book at all. I 100% agree. I think that first of all, yeah, the greatest distraction people have, and I'm glad you keyed into that, is when you start thinking about the marketing, why you're still writing. Don't even, I never think about the marketing or the promotion or any of that stuff until the book's actually creative part is finished. Don't, that's just a distraction for creativity, and it'll hurt your creativity because that's when I start giving you writer's block because you're thinking too much about the audience, the reception, is it going to succeed? But the second thing is, I was always inspired when I was working with Judith Regan at, at HarperCollins. There was a writer she had that did a book on like, there was whatever, whatever, whatever maybe it's 10 years ago, whatever, the, some famous court case. Um, Amber Heard, is that uh, Amber? No, Amber, I don't know what it is. I don't remember the court case, but I'm sure a thousand listeners uh, know, know what it is. Or something, anyway, one of those horrible court cases where somebody was famous for five minutes and she had to get the book out. Mm -hmm. Amber Heard, I think, is a model. Um, so uh, <laughs> so, uh, so they, she had a writer. He wrote it. He literally wrote it in a week. This, this challenged me. So, so he literally wrote the book in a week. He just typed it out as she was talking. He just typed it out. Then he edited it, got it in, hit the New York Times bestseller list. And so it inspired me to think, how fast can I write a memoir? Mm -hmm. So Joel Stein from Time Magazine was writing about the Sarah Palin book. So he called me up. He's like, I want you to write my memoir in the quickest amount of time possible. And I said, awesome. We're going to do this in half a day. Come over for a couple hours. I'll write as you talk. I'm going to send it to my designer. I'll have the cover, the book, the design book by the end of the day. 
And so <laughs> I'll find, I'll get you the link, but he, 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 we put this in time and he put the link on there. I mean, it's a short 25 page book, but it's actually pretty funny and, 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 not, and not bad. So, so, so the answer is it's, it's focused time versus just say, say, you know, say the amount of time you can still write something great, but you have to sit down really focus and really want to kind of write something great versus saying, I just want a book to put, to help my brand or whatever. Yeah. Bad for writing a book. And there's so many bad reasons for writing a book, but on the subject of writing, I mean, of course, with most of your books and certainly all of my books, the books start with personal experience and a lot of interviews or interacting with experts of various types. What have you learned as an interviewer? Obviously, you did it for the Rolling Stone, New York Times. I mean, first of all, you should mention some of the people you've interviewed. I mean, some of the more the better known folks, because the list is super long, but a few examples. And then what have you learned about interviewing that I might be able to use on this podcast that other people might be able to use for all their various projects and whatnot? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love interviewing. I mean, basically like I've done tons of, you know, Rolling Stone cover store. I've basically kind of any, definitely any musician and most actors that probably interviewed them at some point. So yeah, you know, it's interesting. A Rolling Stone or an article or a book interview is different because you have time to play with. Mm. Right. So that's like the, in a way there's the waiting game. I can talk about all the details of that Mm -hmm. and you can choose which one to talk about, but then I got a show at Sirius radio and I just did the show as an experiment or a challenge to think, can I get the material I get with someone in a Rolling Stone interview? Can I get that in a, you know, in just a one hour amount of time that that interview takes. Mm -hmm. And so I actually created a bunch of techniques for the live interview that helped me get to that core really quickly. So do you want to talk about the live interview or the, let's, let's talk about the live interview because I think it will translate. I think the, the principles are probably quite flexible. So why don't you talk about the live interview with some of the, the okay. techniques that you've developed and, and they're using? We'll start with prep, and this is for any, any interview. It's tough to do an interview or to want to do a really, really great interview. I mean, you and I have an awesome rapport, and, and we can just kind of talk, riff and talk about anything. But when I'm preparing for an interview with somebody, I will go research everything they've ever done. I'll try to read if there's any books on them. If they're musicians, I'll listen to everything they've ever done. I'll try to watch every interview because I just want to make myself an expert in them. Mm-hmm. And then I'll write down as many questions as I can think of. Maybe for some, say, well, when I did Rolling Stone interviews, with, I'll, I'll write down hundreds of questions, <laughs> literally, and then I'll study them like I'm studying for an exam. You know, hmm. And I'll mark the ones that I really want to make sure I ask. And then I'll get to meet them. I'll take those questions, I'll fold them up, I'll put them in my back pocket, and I'll never look at them again. Huh. And and then and then I'll let it flow, but I'll know what do I need to go? Where do I need to go? Here's what they've said, but what have they never said? What about them can I show that's a side of them that's never been seen by anybody else? And I'll know I'll the conversation will never hit a dead point and feel completely natural to them, but I'll know where I'm shaping and structuring it. And every now and then if I have a tough one, like I had to do Taylor Lautner for Rolling Stone, who was like that you know, the werewolf kid in Twilight yeah, or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? right. And like I actually thought it was an assignment for someone else, so I said yes, I didn't realize who it was till afterward, and then I realized I got it talk to this guy. And so I actually, my goal always as a writer is just to be interesting. You know, if you bore someone, you've committed to me the cardinal sin of writing. So I would actually walk him into a place where I knew I had a series of five or 10 questions that would lead him somewhere really fun or, or funny or entertaining or interesting or, or somewhere. So there's a part of it where you're actually, like the little segments where I'll almost be like a lawyer where you're walking someone down a chain that's going to end up with, with a unique revelation. So what would, what would be an example or examples of some of those questions? Or, so you can answer this a couple different ways, that or just questions that are not person specific, like hey, tell us about this incident uh, that are just good kind of can openers for getting people to riff and tell you something interesting. Yeah. You know, what's funny, like at one point I thought of making a list of that. Someone wants to uh, write a Rolling Stone wants to interview Bob Dylan and he wants to ask Bob Dylan, who tells you when you're wrong? Hmm. And Bob Dylan got upset and left the interview. <laughs> I thought that's a good question. And I use that question a lot. Huh. But you know what I did? I was, I was going to try and do those kind of canned questions, like, you know, like those cards you get in a game that are fun, right. always good questions. But what I always think about is, here's what I'm thinking about is, now what, is, what do I want to know or what does the audience want to know? I'm trying to, it's again that art of empathy. I really want to think about how from their perspective is life lived? How can I get inside their head and understand what are the things that they wrestle with or they struggle with? Like the conversation we're having as writers is easy to empathize because it's easy for me to talk about it and you're hitting kind of a nerve with me because these are the things I talk about. If you wanted to talk to me about, you know, 
is the game good or bad? You're going to get a horrible interview because you're doing two things. One, or, one is, you know, maybe I'm interpreting that as judgment. Right. Two is it's just sort of a stock answer. You know, three is it's, I'm already yeah, on the defensive and that's going to be boring. But you're at your the questions you're asking are the things that I wrestle with and the things I think about, the things I probably talked about today and yesterday. So even say I'm interviewing a celebrity and there's a scandal or I want to find out they're dating somebody or something like, I'm not going to say, are you dating that person? I'm going to say, what's it like for you when everyone's always, always trying to speculate about who you're dating and you uh, have your own private life that you want to keep. So I'm empathizing with how they see the question, how they see their reality, not how, you know, whatever TMZ sees their reality. Right, right. And at the same time, you're sort of opening, you're like softballing the topic in if they want to choose, if they want to hit it, if they want to swing for it, they can go for it. Yeah, the real, the real trick, and I've given away too much, but the real trick, and this is yeah. again, kind of a celebrity interviewing type of stuff. The real trick is there's a topic that's like, you know that they that you really want, but they don't want to give or share, you wait for them to bring it up. Once they've mentioned it, it's like they've opened the door to it. If you want to get it, it's almost, you know what? It's like anything. It's like the game. It's like getting funding. It's like dating. It's like, if there's something you want from someone, they're not going to want to give it to you. Um, <laughs> and, 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 so, and so the idea is, so you wait for them to bring up the elephant in the room. Right. What, are there any ways to sort of leave the gingerbread trail to get them closer to it? Any particular examples that come to mind? I mean, I know one thing that a lot of journalists do, which sometimes drives me nuts, but I recognize why they do it, is they'll deliberately give false facts to try to get a correction. So they'll say, so, you know, the rumor is that you're dating whatever, Taylor Swift, you know, and then you hope that they'll come back and say, actually, that's completely bullshit. You know, I'm dating so-and-so. And you're like, okay, gotcha. Now we can go down that trail. Right. But are there... But that, that's weak because... It is weak. You've showed... Because you, you show A, it's kind of a little too tricky. B, you've showed you're kind of ignorant about them. And C, you're trying to like kind of capture them. So you might even get that one answer, but you'll have a, a shitty interview. Yeah, no, exactly. But it, it is a common technique that journalists use, right? I mean, right. No, uh, yeah, not, oh, not for sure. Very, very common. The other one that makes me kind of crazy, and I've had to learn how to defend against it because it's so easy to be misquoted in print, is the, so I guess what you're saying is fill in the blank, and then all of a sudden you're quoted as saying that. <laughs> You're like, yeah, hey, whatever, right. I guess pretty close. And then all of a sudden you're quoted. But what are some... And, of, and that's kind of equivalent to sitting down to write a book and not letting the book tell the story of you trying to force your story on the book. It's you try to force your story on the, on the, on the subject. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's a way to get... It's a short-term gain for long-term loss, which is, you know, untruthful <laughs> you know, journalism. Yeah. How do you... And then not having a good reputation. Go in ahead. the case of Taylor, when you wanted to sort of be interesting and have a series of questions that would lead somewhere interesting for the piece itself. How did you go about doing that? I mean, yeah, it's basically like there's a technique of like creating a yes ladder. You know, it's a, fun, it's a famous right. kind of persuasion technique, which is, you know, asking them something safe and it's yes, and then a little bit safer and it's yes. And then would you ever do it with this? You know, you know, like, you know, like, let's just say example, and this is not far off. I, I, I'll find it if it's someone, you know, you know, you, you know, you seem like you're a healthy guy. You're not a smoker, right? You know, you don't smoke. He's like, right. no, I don't, I don't smoke. And then so you've never, then you obviously never smoke pot, right? You know, and then right. you're getting somewhere very interesting that there's a Taylor Lautner smoke pot. And then, and then we got down to like traffic tickets. And then we had this fun game of me trying to like find something he's done like wrong or illegal, like, you know, <laughs> you've never even double parked or whatever. And it was kind of a fun, you know, and so it's walking into a natural way that's fun for them versus like, I want something from you and I'm going to try to get it and I'm going to try to hold it and keep it from you. Mm -hmm. Another secret for interviews that are, and I'm sure is uh, the idea of fractionation, right? Fractionation and hypnosis is if you are hypnotizing someone and you bring them out of trance mm -hmm. and then you put them back in trance, they go in deeper the second time. Mm. So whenever I'm interviewing somebody, especially for Rolling Stone or anything, I always try to break it into a couple little pieces. We do a little bit of interview, then we maybe go have lunch, go dinner, maybe go somewhere else, and that second interview is always better. Huh, that's interesting. That's very, very and fascinating. Even with my radio show, and this is, this, is, uh, so this is something for people with podcasts or radio shows, and again, I don't know how relevant this is to everybody. I again, I love this stuff. I love the art of... It's really the art of trying to get someone to be themselves. Right. <laughs> um, it's really the goal because as soon as someone, people go into interview mode and they're to try to show you what, how they want to be perceived, not to not, not who they are. Right. So with, with my radio show, the first, we pre recorded and the first 10 minutes were actually a complete throwaway. We do the first 10 minutes, go to a break. And that was, we recorded, but that's always a throwaway because it allows them to get their promotional message out and they're, you know, feel like they've said their message and beyond their message, there's a person and I get rid of their message and get to the person. <laughs> that's hilarious. So wait, do they end up being able to plug the, the stuff that they, that they wanted oh, to yeah. plug by coming on the show or do you, 
<laughs> scrap yeah, the whole yeah, thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll always plug for you. I'll always tell somebody, and this is yeah. true, when you're going on and you know, you're trying to promote your business or your brand or your book or your movie or whatever you're promoting, the more you, it's that goes back to that philosophy, the more you want somebody to do something and the more desperate you are, the more they don't want to do it. Yeah. You're, you're selling yourself. If they like you, they'll like what you have to offer. You're not selling your book. You're representing it by yeah. who you are. Absolutely. So yeah. my thought is it's the, it's your job or the host job to, to do the promotion for you. Your job is to be the most awesome version of you you can be. Yeah, definitely. Getting them to trust the messenger and not the message first and foremost. Right, because I mean, if you're somewhere and they keep mentioning, you know, we listen to those interviews, right? And, they're, and they keep mentioning their website and, have, and putting the www in front of it or whatever it is. <laughs> and you're just like, I don't even want to go to your stupid website. <laughs> right? If you're interested, right. if, you're, if someone wants, is interested in me, I don't need to mention my book. I don't mean to mention where they find them. I need to mention my website because my name's on the podcast and there's, there's, some, there's, there's plenty of search engines that will lead, lead them there without me having to say it. Definitely. Yeah, and so, so that's for anybody. Like, don't go on to sell, go on to represent. That's excellent advice. Uh, well, I want to be cognizant of your time, obviously. Uh, I want to just ask a couple more questions, and then obviously we talk all the time, so we can keep talking right. <laughs> about this for hours. But the, uh, the first is, what books, if any, do you gift to other people the most, besides your own books? What, are there any books, resources, things that you give to people in the written format? So it's probably one you give away a lot, and you've given it away in your blog. Oh, is this, uh, God, it could be anything. Seneca? It could be. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's it. Yeah. yeah. On the shortest of life. That's my, that, that I have a stack of those, the, that little penguin edition, I think it is. Yeah. So that I give away a lot. And the other ones I, the other ones I tend to buy a lot for, for people. I have, a, I have a friend right now who I'm encouraging to read fiction. He's a voracious nonfiction reader. And I'm a big fan of reading fiction because, you know, especially your audience and to degree, degree, my audience, uh, you know, a lot of people feel like we got to read self-help books because that no, that's knowledge and we don't want to waste any time. We want to be efficient, but right. people learn through metaphor. That's how the first stories were told. That's what the Bible is. That's metaphor and storytelling are how the brain actually learns information. When you just get it as data, mm -hmm. that's good for computers. It's not good for, for human learning. Right. And so, so I really encourage people to read great works of really good works of fiction and literature, A, because it's an art and B, because I have learned more about life from, from fiction. So, the two books that I told them, the book I told them to start with was, and it's kind of a deeper one because he's a, I guess an art, he's an artist. And so I thought that, uh, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, A Hundred Years of Solitude, I just think it's a mm -hmm. good book to appreciate, you know, literature and storytelling and the magic world that can be weaved through fiction. So I, I'll give that away. There's a dark, dark book by Jerzy Kaczynski called The Painted Bird. Huh. It's really, it's really dark, but it's unputdownable. Huh. That I tend to give away a the lot. The Painted Bird. Uh, yeah, by Jerzy Kaczynski. It's, it's disturbing though. So just know that it's a, might be for a plane ride and not before bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's about, I, you know what, just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you learn about human nature through that, through, through that book for, for artists. There's a book by Milan Kundera that I give away a lot called life is elsewhere. And huh. it's about, this is my interpretation of it, which is probably completely wrong. It's been a few years, but he's, there's someone who's born and he got to become, and he's born to be a great artist. He's become going to become a great poet, but his, issues his his mother issues and the sort of politics and peer pressures at the time turn him into a total hack hmm. and i think it's an analogy for that choice we all have in life you know are you going to fulfill your potential are you just going to give in to the you know the peer pressure of the moment and, and become nothing i was talking to this billionaire friend of mine and 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 i i was saying i really would like to write a book about the way your mind works and he was saying that the difference between someone who's, say, a billionaire and a billionaire, it's so stupid to even talk about this, but, so, but is that the people who really think big are not, a, he said, the biggest mistake you can make is to accept the norms of your time. Oh, I love it. By not accepting norms is where you innovate, whether it's with technology, with books, with anything. So not accepting the norms is the secret to really big success and changing the world. That's a fantastic way to wrap up this episode, I think. So, Neil, I'm going to ask. I know that you don't have to say because people can just use Google and other tools, but where can people learn more about your work, find more of your stuff? Where would you like people to, to, to find you? I'm going to let them choose. After that big speech, it would be <laughs> completely hypocritical to go, <laughs> to go say anything. They can, they, can, they can find me in, there in various ways. <laughs> on your blog, on, okay. on the 4 <laughs> 
<laughs> Appreciate you not throwing the WWW in there. Uh, all right, man. Well, many conversations to be had, to be continued. Thanks for making the time. And uh, I will hope to have some wine with you soon. Thank you, sir. All right. Talk soon. Always enjoyable. Bye, uh, all right, buddy. Bye-bye. If you want more of the Tim Ferriss Show, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to fourhourblog.com. Where you'll find an award winning blog, tons of audio and video interview stories with people like Warren Buffett and Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park, the books, plus much, much more. Follow Tim on Twitter. It's twitter.com slash T Ferris. That's T F E R R I S S. Or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tim Ferriss. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>